welcome to each one of you once again. We're glad you are here. I have shared you in the past that whenever I speak someplace, I always look to the Lord for confirmation. God has done it again. If I were to title my message this morning, it is Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Worship team, you did not know this, but right here in my introduction, listen carefully. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face, and the things of earth will go strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. And that is what we began our service with. And they had no idea what we were speaking on this morning. As I was over these notes this morning before I came to church, I decided to get up to hymn book and turn to that hymn. And I want to, as part of the introduction, I'm going to read the verses that go along with the chorus. Because so often we look at the chorus, which is so powerful. But I don't want to hear the words of the verses that correspond to this. O oh soul, are you weary and troubled? No light in the darkness you see. There's light for look at the Savior, and life more abundant and free. Through death and through life everlasting, he passed, and we follow him there. Over us, sin no more have dominion, for more than conquerors we are. His word shall not fail you, he promised. Believe him, and all will be well. Then go to a world that is dying, his perfect salvation to tell. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face, and the things of earth will go strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. And that is what I want to do this morning. To simply put aside all the cares and concerns, and I want to focus on Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Let's pray. Father, thank you for allowing us to be here this morning. Thank you for your presence. Thank you for your peace. Thank you for the power of the Holy Spirit. Thank you for how you encourage. Thank you for how you led the worship team in the choice of songs this morning. Thank you for each one here. I believe we are here because you have brought us here and you have something to say to each one of us. And so I pray once again that you would allow us to put aside all other thoughts and cares and concerns and may we focus on you and you alone. Spirit of the living God, fall fresh on us. Accomplish the Father's will during these next few moments. Thank you, Father, for your word. This powerful, active, alive, sharper, than two edged sword. And I pray that you would administer to each one of our hearts as only you can, as only you know how. You know what each one of us stands in need of. So we commit ourselves to you, commit this time to you. And we give you praise for what you are going to accomplish in Jesus' name. Amen. As we look at some scripture this morning, and as we prepare hearts for communion, I want us to focus on three aspects of Jesus. The three aspects are the suffering of the Savior, the sacrifice of the Savior, and the salvation of the Savior. First of all, the suffering of the Savior. How often do we stop and reflect on what Christ endured for us? I think if we're honest, we would have to say we don't spend a lot of time thinking about the suffering that Christ endured leading up to his crucifixion on the cross. 
I don't think we often remind ourselves what he endured for you and for me. I remember so well after the movie, The Passion of Christ came out. So many people were talking about it. They mentioned how impressed they were with his message. Many commented on the horrific scenes showing the suffering of Christ. And I have to ask the question, have we so quickly forgotten what Christ went through? My wife and I try to watch this movie every year around Easter time. We don't always manage that, but we attempt to do that. Because I don't want to forget what Christ went through. I've often shared this with my students in school. And I remember on occasion, they said, Mr. Wells, stop, no more. It's too horrible to think about. And I'm thinking, isn't that the point? Don't we want to stop and remind ourselves what Christ went through? I don't ever want to get to the point where I take that for granted, where I lose sight of that. To think that he did that for me and for you and for all mankind. Let me just read some scripture. I'm going to turn there. Just allow your minds to reflect on what the Word of God says with regard to the suffering of Christ. I'm going to begin reading some verses in Matthew 26 and 27. But in Matthew 26, we begin at verse 67, and it says this. Then they spit in his face and struck him with their fists. Others slapped him and said, Prophesy to us, Christ, who hit you? I don't know if I can think of anything more dehumanizing than spitting on someone. That to me is just so disgusting. And yet, they spit, not only on but they spit in his face. And then when I think of the fact that it says they struck him with their fist, others slapped him. I wish I had something a little more sturdy here. It's going to go to my whiteboard. But I've asked my students at the time, what do you think hurts worse, a fist or a slap? I want to suggest to you a slap hurts a lot worse than a fist. I can hit only so much with my fist. But I tell you something, I can really slap a lot harder than I hit my fist. And to think that not only did they hit him with their fist, but they slapped him. I can't imagine the pain that that caused him. And yet, he endured that. Chapter 27, verses 28 to 30, we read these words. Matthew 27, and yet verse 28. They stripped him and put a scrub robe on him and then twisted together a crown of thorns and set it on his head. They put a staff in his right hand and out in front of him and mocked him. Hail, king of the Jews, they said. They spit on him and took the staff and struck him on the head again and again. We would be embarrassed if we were stripped in front of other people. And yet, that is what happened to Jesus. Talk about being humiliated. And then they take this crown of thorns, and as we've been told, it wasn't, you know, these types of thorns that we think of that are very short, but they were lengthy thorns. And I don't imagine my mind, as I try to envision the scene, I don't think they put it on him gently. I'm sure they took that crown of thorns and just pushed it down hard as they could. And we know what thorns do to us. They're painful. Because, and of course, with head wounds, they bleed profusely. And again, try to picture what Jesus put up with that was leading up to the cross. 
All this is prior to that. And that's why I don't ever want us to get to put where we forget what Christ endured. The suffering of the Savior. And then in the same chapter, and we skip down to verse 46. About the ninth hour, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus, on top of all of the physical suffering, had to deal with that mental anguish, knowing the fact his father had to turn his back on him because of the sins that Christ was carrying for all mankind. I can't even begin to imagine what that moment must have been like for him. To feel like all of a sudden he's all alone with the weight of all the sin of mankind on him. And yet he endured that for each one of us. There's more that we could look at, but I do want to read from John 19 and verse 17. After all he has gone through, we come now to John chapter 19 and verse 17. Carrying his own cross, he went out to the place of the skull. Near make is called Agatha. He was made to carry his own cross. And we know that he was by this point in time so weak, so beaten, that he could only carry it so far. They had to get someone else to come along and carry it the rest of the way. But I want to read one more passage from the Old Testament that I believe gives us a rather explicit description of Christ at this point in time. I want to begin in Isaiah chapter 52 at verse 13, which is towards the end of the chapter. I want to read chapter 53, which is a very familiar passage of Scripture to us, but I think it bears listening to, imagining what we find here I trust that we read scripture, that we take time to reflect on what was it like? Put ourselves in that scene. Visualize, internalize what's going on. But as we come to Isaiah 52 and verse 13, the title of my Bible for this section is The Suffering and Glory of the Servant, referring to Jesus. See, my servant will act wisely. He'll be raised, lifted up, and highly exalted, just as there were many who were appalled at him. Refer now to what he's gone through, all the physical suffering. Okay, they were appalled at him. His appearance was so disfigured beyond that of any man, as for marred beyond human likeness. That says to me it was hard to recognize Jesus because of his body being torn apart. So badly beaten. So he sprinkled many nations and kings will shut their mouth because of him. For what they were not told, they will see. What they have not heard, they understand. Who has believed our message? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up before him like a tender shoot and like a root on dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him. Nothing has appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men. A man of sorrows and familiar with suffering. Like one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he took up our infirmities and carried our sorrows. Yet we considered him stricken by God, smitten by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him. And by his wounds we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way, and the Lord has led in him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was like a lamb to slaughter, and as a sheep before shears is silent, so he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away. And who can speak of his descendants? For he is cut off from the land of the living, for the transgression of my people he was stricken. He was assigned a grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death, 
Though he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. And though the Lord makes his life a guilt offering, he will see his offspring and prolong his days. And the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. After the suffering of his soul, he will see the light of life and be satisfied by his knowledge. My righteous servant will justify many, and he will bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will give him a portion among the great, who divide his spoils with the strong, because he poured out his life unto death, and was numbered with transgressors. For he bore the sin of many, made intercession for the transgressors. One source pointed out that Christ was tried illegally six times, leading up to his crucifixion. He went before Annas, the high priest, Caiaphas, the high priest, the Sanhedrin, or the Jewish religious leaders, Pilate, Herod, and back to Pilate again. All in a matter of hours prior to his death. I want to read the words of another hymn. And let me say something. There have been times where I spend, my wife's not home, I spend some time just worshiping the Lord. I get out of the hymn book, and I just go through, and I just sing to the Lord. And there have been times where I've had this thought, I've not followed through yet, but sometime I would like to put a message together just reading hymns, because there's so much meat in them, and as I read them, as I sing them, I'm thinking, these are all messages in of themselves. Amen. And so, sometimes, don't be surprised if you come and all I do is read one hymn after another. I'm going to share a few hymns this morning. But as we think of the suffering of the Savior, let me read these words to you. King of my life, I crown thee now. Thine shall the glory be. Lest I forget, lest I forget thy thorn crown brow, lead me to Calvary. Show me the tomb where thou wast laid, tenderly mourned and wept, angels in robes of light arrayed, garden thee whilst thou slept. Let me like Mary through the gloom, come with a gift to thee. Show to me now the empty tomb, lead me to Calvary. May I be willing, Lord, to bear daily my cross for thee, even thy cup of grief to share, thou hast borne all for me. Lest I forget Gethsemane, lest I forget thine agony, lest I forget thy love for me, <coughs> lead me to Calvary. The suffering of the Savior. Point number two, the sacrifice of the Savior. I want to read just a few verses that remind us of the sacrifice of our Savior. The first verse I want to read is 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 7. 1 Corinthians 5 and verse 7. Get rid of the old yeast that you may be a new batch without yeast as you really are. For Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. Hebrews chapter 9. Verses 24 to 28. Hebrews 9, being at 24, reading down to verse 28. For Christ did not enter a man-made sanctuary that was only a copy of the true one. He entered heaven itself, now to appear for us in God's presence. Nor did he enter heaven to offer himself again and again, the way the high priest enters the most holy place every year, with blood that is not his own. Then Christ would have had to suffer many times since the creation of the world, but now he's appeared once for all at the end of the age to do away with sin by the sacrifice of himself. Just as man is destined to die once and after that to face judgment, so Christ was sacrificed once to take away the sins of many people and he would appear a second time not to bear sin, but to bring salvation to those who are waiting for him. The sacrifice of the Savior. I came across this phrase in a book titled, Winning the Race. The sacrificing and shedding of the blood of the Lamb in the Old Testament did not take away the sins of the people. 
when they sacrificed a lamb, they were acknowledging to God that they could not rid themselves of their sins, but needed a Savior. The blood of the lamb temporarily covered their sins. They were waiting for Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, to one day sacrifice himself and shed his own blood for them. That's why we read, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. You see, Jesus, the perfect Son of God, the perfect Lamb of God, had become our sacrifice to take our place so that we could experience forgiveness of sins and eternal life. The sacrifice of the Savior. Another hymn, and again I believe the words are so appropriate for what we are looking at this morning. Man of sorrows, what a name. For the Son of God who came, ruined sinners to reclaim. Hallelujah, what a Savior. Bearing shame and scoffing rude, in my place condemned he stood. Sealed my pardon with his blood. Hallelujah, what a Savior. Guilty, vile, and helpless we. Spotless, Lamb of God was he. Full atonement can it be. Hallelujah. What a Savior. Lifted up was he to die. It is finished, was his cry. Now in heaven exalted high. Hallelujah. What a Savior. When he comes, our glorious King, all his ransom home to bring, then anew the song will sing. Hallelujah. What a Savior. We're going to sing it soon, I believe. Very soon. Hallelujah. What a Savior. The suffering Savior, the sacrifice of the Savior, and thirdly, the salvation of the Savior. Go back to a very familiar past we read at Christmas time, but I want to read it for us this morning. Matthew chapter 1 and verse 21. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus. Because he will save his people from their sins. Jesus, Savior. The salvation of the Savior. He will save his people from their sins. Acts chapter 4. And I want to begin reading the second part of verse 10. And then I want to read through verse 12. Acts chapter 4. Second part of verse 10 down through verse 12. It is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead, that this man stand before you healed. He is the stone you built rejected, which has become the capstone. Salvation is found in no one else. Read that again. Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to men by which we must be saved. There is only one name by which we say that is the name of Jesus. Amen. Jesus. Jesus. And then one more verse. First John chapter 4 and verse 14. And we have seen and testify that the Father has sent his Son to be the Savior of the world. The salvation of the Savior. Obviously, there is so much that could be said about each of these. But let me one more time read another hymn that deals with the salvation of the Savior. Christ has for sin atonement made, but a wonderful Savior. We are redeemed the price is paid. What a wonderful Savior. I praise Him for the cleansing blood. What a wonderful Savior. That reconciled my soul to God. What a wonderful Savior. He cleansed my heart from all sin. What a wonderful Savior. And now He reigns and rules therein. What a wonderful Savior. He gives me overcoming power. What a wonderful Savior. And triumph in each trying hour. What a wonderful Savior. To him I've given all my heart. 
what a wonderful Savior. The world shall never share apart. What a wonderful Savior. What a wonderful Savior is Jesus, my Jesus. What a wonderful Savior is Jesus, my Lord. The suffering of the Savior, the sacrifice of the Savior, the salvation of the Savior. As we prepare for communion, let's focus on these three extremely significant aspects of our Savior. His great suffering, His gruesome sacrifice, His glorious salvation. One more time. His great suffering. Let's never, ever forget His great suffering. At the same time, let's never, ever forget His gruesome sacrifice. And thirdly, let's never, ever forget His glorious salvation that we experience in part right now, but think of eternity with Him forever. I want to and just one more comment, and then we'll be finished. I've heard the Catholics criticized for always having their crucifixes with Christ on them, and for always having pictures of the cross with Jesus on it. The comment that I've heard over and over again is, Christ going around the cross, so why do they keep him there? And that's partly true. But I want to suggest the following. Let's never, ever in our mind forget what it would look like if we had been there to see Jesus hanging on the cross. May we never, ever forget what he went through for us. However, I am thankful for the cross that no longer bears our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Yes, he died. He was buried. But he rose again. And he's coming again. And I love about you, but I look forward to that time. Amen. When we shall see him face to face. I believe Paul had this in mind when he quotes Jesus in 1 Corinthians 11, 24 and 25. This is my body, which is for you. Do this in what? Remembrance of me. This cup is no cup of my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. Brothers, sisters in Christ, my prayer, my desire is that we not only do it on Communion Sunday, when we hear those words, do this in the universe of me, but may we be reminded of all we talked about this morning constantly. May we never, ever take it lightly, forget about it, put it aside, but may we allow God, the Holy Spirit, to bring back to us what Christ endured, His suffering, His sacrifice, his salvation. We have a lot to be thankful for, to be grateful for. Hallelujah! What a Savior. Father, thank you. Thank you for this time in this place. Thank you again for your precious, holy, written word that used to us Jesus, the living word. Thank you for your great love that was shown to us when while we had sinners, you sent Christ to die for us. But we are so thankful that it didn't stop there, that yes, he died, he was buried, but he rose again, and we know he's coming again. And I pray that even as we partake now of communion, may we do so in remembrance of what he went through. May remember that it's all about Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. It's not about us. It's not about this world that's going on around us. It's all about Jesus. May we
continually turn our eyes upon Jesus and look full in his wonderful face so the things of this earth would grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. And we pray all these things in that wonderful, matchless, powerful, mighty name of Jesus.